Chapter Twenty One of the Riddle of the Purple Emperor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Riddle of the Purple Emperor by Mary E. Hanshu and Thomas W. Hanshu. Chapter Twenty One. Tis a mad world, my masters. For a minute, the young man made neither sound nor movement. And Cleek was tempted to believe that his presence there was accidental, a mere trick of chance. But of a sudden, as he peered farther out, he caught a glimpse of Sir Edgar's face, and that one glance told him that here was no chance eavesdropper, but one whose hatred of the Hindu presumably would carry him very near to murder now if he had not already committed that act. His face was white with the passion that kills if need be, and his twitching hands and lips told their own story. As Cleek's eyes fell on a little shining instrument in one of those shaking hands, he knew it was time to act quickly. He leaned over just as Sir Edgar raised the revolver to aim at Gunga Dahl's retreating figure, and with a grip of iron, grasped the boy by the shoulder. He swung his slim figure over the shallow window-sill and into the ballroom before you could say Jack Robinson. The strength of his muscles was extraordinary, and as the young man stood before him, sputtering in fury at this calm proceeding, Cleek gave a short, sharp laugh. Ha! <laughs> Took you rather by surprise, didn't I, my friend? he said, as Sir Edgar turned upon him menacingly. But quick thought demands quick action, and my apologies are manifold. Believe me— Who the devil are you, and what are you doing here? cut in Sir Edgar angrily, trying to recognise the strangely contorted face of the man who stood guard over him. Who am I? replied Cleek, with a light chuckle. Ah, my friend, more than you would like to have that question answered. What I am doing is another matter, preventing another murder, I fancy. Anyway, he gave a quick spring, and there came a swift rustle, a metallic click. The revolver was on the floor, and a band of steel was locked about each of the young man's wrists. You! put handcuffs on me sir edgar cried out angrily how dare you commit such an outrage i'll have you arrested i better let that subject alone young man i suppose you don't realize that i overheard all that passed between gunga dahl and lady brenton just now well and you know that he lied put in sir edgar eagerly my mother wasn't there that night you must know that "'On the contrary, my friend, I know that she was,' responded Cleek serenely. Sir Edgar made an effort to raise his shackled hands. His face was passionate. "'It's a lie, an infernal lie, I tell you,' he cried vehemently. "'It was I who killed the old woman, if you want to know the truth, not Lady Brenton.' "'I do want to know the truth,' replied Cleek severely. "'but that is not it, so don't tell any more lies than you are obliged to. "'If I say Lady Brenton was here that night, "'it does not mean that she killed Miss Chayne, nor that you did either, "'despite the fact that you had a revolver in your pocket.' "'A sudden startled look passed over Sir Edgar's face. "'His mouth was a little drawn.' "'Then what is the meaning of this outrage? "'What right have you to arrest me?' "'He said, with a very creditable attempt at bluster, "'which deceived Cleek not at all. "'The right of the law, young man. "'You asked me who I was just now. "'Well, I'll tell you as much as the world knows. "'I am Cleek, Cleek of Scotland Yard. "'Cleek!' Filled with astonishment and not a little awe, Sir Edgar found himself looking into a hard, cynical face, with narrowed eyes and a thin-lipped, cruel mouth. Cleek smiled. "'Perhaps you know this man better,' 
he said quietly, and in a flash his features blent, softened, altered, made of themselves yet another mask, and Sir Edgar found himself gazing into the face of Lieutenant Deland. "'Good heavens, the lieutenant!' he said, with a throb of fear in his voice. "'Then you were that man, and Mr. Narkom knew all the time?' "'Yes, Sir Edgar. And perhaps, too, you can tell me of this one, eh?' In a flash, that face had given place to the bovine stupidity of Mr. George Headland, as the young man had seen him at Scotland Yard. "'Mr. George Headland!' The name scarcely sounded above a whisper, and Cleek smiled a little as his face now resumed its normal expression. "'All three, my friend,' he said genially. "'So you see it is useless to attempt to deceive me. "'I have given you these proofs to drive that lesson home. "'Put yourself unreservedly in my hands and you will be safe. "'Otherwise, well, remember that the inquest is only postponed, not settled.' Something of menace in the low tones caused the face of Sir Edgar Brenton to grow more pale, and for a brief moment there was silence. Then Cleek spoke swiftly. "'Give me your word to work with me on the side of the law, and I will see that the one you seek to shield shall not be harmed so much as by a hair of her head,' he said. "'Do you believe me?' "'Yes, I do.' Do, Mr. Mr. George Headland, please. Very well, Mr. Headland, I place myself in your hands completely. If you will give me your word of honour to say nothing, absolutely nothing, to any living soul about this. You may safely trust the knowledge with me, responded Cleek lightly, as he undid the manacled hands. "'And now, Sir Edgar, I want you to tell me everything that happened that night, "'and the night when the impostor was also killed. "'Then go up to town and stay there till I send for you. "'Now, fire away.' "'Sir Edgar hesitated, then gave a queer little gulp. "'Well, I suppose there is no help for it,' he said in a shaken voice, "'seating himself beside Cleek on the wide window-seat. I was coming back from a dinner party, just as I said. But I meant to see Margaret, despite Miss Cheyne, and I still had that revolver in my pocket. It was the revolver that Miss Cheyne herself threw at me that same day, when, like a fool, I tried to get her consent to our happiness. How and why this one was marked with my initial as it was, I don't know. But I'll swear, Mr. Cl Headland that the first one was not. I'll take my oath on that. It was a Smith & Wesson repeater. Well, anyhow, I came back to Chain Court, and after knocking till I was tired, I was about to turn away and had got to the bottom of the steps, when I thought I heard the sound of footsteps behind me. On turning, to my astonishment, I found the door ajar. In I went, and as I did so, there came the sound of a shot from the ballroom. Ah, then it was you I heard when I knocked, interposed Cleek. Sir Edgar nodded. Yes, I didn't stop to notice, just rushed into that room and saw the old woman dead and not a soul to be seen. Then I heard your knocking again. I think I lost my head. I thought it might be the police. I know I was mad but I'd just made a dash for the window and was out and through it like a shot. Hmm. Then there was someone else in the house, too, for it was a woman who crossed that lawn. One who wore a gold scarf, said Cleek, his brows knitted. Well, go on. What next? You can imagine my feelings when you said you had been driven out by Miss Chain herself when I met you in the lane. I thought that in my fright I had imagined the murder, and that she must just have fainted and come to afterward. 
I know it was silly, but I was afraid to speak. That's all right, said Cleek quietly. But now what about the second murder? How did you come to go to Chain Court again? That wants explaining away, too. And it can easily be explained, retorted Sir Edgar rapidly. I was trying to find Lady Margaret, and I caught a glimpse, or thought I did, of a woman's figure in the grounds, and followed it right into the house. There again I found the body of Miss Cheyne, as naturally I took it to be, and felt I must have gone out of my senses. There was something queer and supernatural in finding her again in the same spot. Like a donkey, I took to my heels and ran straight into Dr. Verrill halfway down the lane. Cleek twitched up an inquiring eyebrow. Met Dr. Verrill in the lane, did you? Yes. He told me he had come from Miss Wynne's house. He had been to borrow some drug from the old doctor's surgery or something. Anyway, I tell you, I was tempted to blurt out the truth, but again I was afraid, for, as a matter of fact, we are not usually the best of friends. You see, well... He broke off, finding this position rather more awkward than the others had been. A little one-sided smile crept up Cleek's face, and he put his hand upon the young man's shoulder. I know, he said quietly. He was jealous of you and Miss Wynne, wasn't he? She, er, uh, entertains somewhat of a liking for you, doesn't she? Yes, that's just it. Not that there was any cause, for though I have known Jenny all my life, I have never dreamt of marrying her. And after I met Margaret, she was the only girl in the world. I know, I know, Cleek said quietly. But to return to our mutton, Sir Edgar, didn't you meet anyone else at all? Just think a moment. No woman at all, eh? For a moment Sir Edgar hesitated. Then his honest eyes met Cleek's and read the knowledge in their keen depths. Yes he said in a broken, choked voice. You seem to know everything, Mr. Headland. I met my mother. She was doing what I know now she often had done when perturbed or upset, walking in her sleep. God knows why she had chosen that particular part to wander in, but asleep she certainly was, for she failed to recognise me at all and I managed to lead her gently back until she was once more in her bedroom. Cleek looked at the young man sharply for a moment, as though questioning the verity of this statement. Walking in her sleep, eh? That would account for many things. He remembered that Ailsa had told him about the sound of footsteps in Lady Brenton's room. Walking in her sleep, eh? So that was the explanation, was it? Or was it not likely to have been a case of hypnotism? Then, remembering Lady Brenton's headaches, Cleek began to see daylight at last. So Gunga Dahl had not been lying after all when he said he saw her ladyship. And she had not lied either in replying that she knew she wasn't there. For if she were walking in her sleep, Lady Brenton certainly did not know of the fact. And that cleared a good many things in Cleek's mind. You know I'm speaking the truth, Mr. Headland. You do believe me, don't you? Put in Sir Edgar suddenly with a little anxious note in his voice. I take my oath on it, you know. No need for that, my friend, responded Cleek with a smile. Your word is enough. But if you want to help me, 
keep your eye on our young friend Bobby Wynne when you get to town. His movements will possibly be somewhat interesting, and I'd like to keep posted regarding them. So she was walking in her sleep then, eh? I begin to see light. Well, I'm hanged if I do, responded Sir Edgar, with a little shrug of the shoulders. Still, I'll do my part, and if only you'll find my Margaret. God, Mr. Headland, I'll do anything in the world to show my gratitude. Their hands met and clasped for a moment in the grip of friendship, and in the next Sir Edgar was striding away with new hope. Cleek watched him go from the room and swing down the long path that lay by the window. Then he faced round suddenly and took up his stand once more by the broad window sill to reconsider the changed aspect of things. Lady Brenton was clearly out of the case now, for it was not possible that she could have committed the actual murder even in her sleep so the case had narrowed down once more. What was worse, it was centering on the girl who had worn that gold scarf, Lady Margaret herself. And yet he would not believe that even desperate as she might have been made, she could deliberately kill her enemy. Yet if it were not she... Who, then, had worn the scarf in her place? Not Miss Jennifer, for her scarf had been gold, it is true, but of a different colour and texture. The thought of her appearance recalled Dr. Verrill, and again Cleek frowned heavily. Dr. Verrill knew more than he had revealed at the inquest, Instinctively, Cleek realised that the doctor was trying to shield Jennifer Wynne from discovery, shield the girl he loved despite everything. Jennifer had access to the old doctor's surgery, and someone had undoubtedly tampered with the bottle of prussic acid, as he knew already. Dr. Verrill himself might have climbed up, but the shreds of cloth which Cleek had found clinging to the ivy were not like any suit Dr. Verrill had worn, certainly not like the black broadcloth which he had on the night of the murder, when fetched from the lane where he had lurked so opportunely. True, he might have changed quickly, but not so quickly as that. Cleek was still bent on the problem but not so absorbed that he did not hear yet another light footfall outside, one that seemed to be approaching the window where he still sat. It stopped right under the window, and Cleek did not dare so much as move a finger lest he betray his presence. Backward and forward paced the light steps, and the rustle of a skirt told him it was a woman. Two, three, five minutes passed, and Cleek sat hunched and motionless, unable to see who this new visitor to the house of mystery might be. That it was someone keeping a tryst was only too evident, waiting, too, for someone who had been delayed past an agreed time, as was indicated by the impatient tapping of one foot on the path. Well, Cleek was prepared to wait all night, if necessary. A sound came suddenly across the night, the sound of a cuckoo. With a little cry of relief, the woman outside answered the cry softly and clearly. Quick, I am here! Cleek heard the words almost gasped out. Then there came the sound of snapping twigs, as if a man were forcing his way through the dense shrubberies, followed by the sharp crunch of feet on the gravel. With these came the soft whisper of a man's voice, 
warning the woman to keep silence as she rushed toward him in a state bordering on absolute hysteria. Quick, she said again, if I am discovered here, or my absence noticed, all is lost. You don't know what horrors of suspense I have endured. I was afraid you would think better of your promise and go to the police after all. All through the inquest I dreaded every opening of the door. Tell me you won't give him up. He is so young. Oh, I shall scream in a minute. Again came the man's whispered, Hush! And then he broke forth suddenly in an excited undertone. I tell you I saw him, he said, in a voice which was quite unfamiliar to Cleek. If you've got the money, you're right. If not... He let the rest go by default, and Cleek heard a little moan of distress come from the woman. All I've got left is here. I can't give you another penny, she cried, and Cleek heard her fumbling as in a bag. But now he scarcely noticed her movements. Other and more startling thoughts were in his mind. A scent of jasmine was in his nostrils. He did not need to move or see now. He knew that the unseen speaker was Jennifer Wynne, and that the boy she was trying to save was none other than the lad she had mothered and watched over, her idle young scamp of a brother. It was all as plain as a pike staff. The lad, in the power of the tipster Blake, had seen through his disguise, and in the quarrel that must have followed, had murdered him. But with what? The prussic acid had been taken from his father's dispensary. Had he then gone prepared to kill him? Or was it not Bobby, after all, for whom Jennifer was allowing herself to be blackmailed? Could it be Sir Edgar? And who was this man who had discovered her secret, this man who was keeping back in the shadow of the bushes? What part was his in this grim tragedy of death? It was Jennifer herself who gave the answer. I tell you this is the last I can give you or get from anywhere or anyone, she said in a low, tense tone. I knew you were both out for something directly I recognized the imposture. But you must be content and leave me alone. How do I know that you didn't kill him yourself, for that matter? Oh, if I only knew, if I only knew the truth that it were not my boy! Here her voice stopped, and for a reason which made Cleek groan inwardly. Down at the end of the path there came the sound of feet. He knew and understood what was happening, what an unkind blow fate had dealt him. Dollops was returning to be near his master, lest anything unforeseen should occur. There was just one little rustle like the sound of notes crackling. Then Jennifer sped forward along the path that led away from the house. The bushes crackled and snapped again, and the sound of a man's running feet echoed faintly from the other side of the hedge. Cleek was on his feet and over the window sill like a flash. He ran down the lane openly, without so much as a look towards Dollops, struck through the ground, and cut into the meadows adjoining. Yes, there was the figure of his quarry. Cleek bent his head and ran on. It was but a brief second, then he looked up to find his man again. He stopped short, as though struck by some invisible force. Far as I could see were the smooth green meadows, dotted here and there in the distance with slumbering sheep. But of sign of human being there was none. The man had disappeared, as though the ground or the sky had opened and swallowed him up. Cleek was alone in that expanse of green pasture, utterly and entirely alone. End of chapter 21